September 2012 in Melbourne. A 29-year-old woman disappears while walking home after a night out. The CCTV footage showed a man talking with her on the street. At once, everybody needed to know, who is this man in the blue hoodie? Investigations would uncover the secrets of a violent murderer. Police officers said that they were looking at a potential serial killer. He didn't actually look, at first glance, like an evil monster that he plainly was. And flaws in the Australian parole system were exposed. Had our justice system worked better, she'd be alive today. The murder of Jill Maher was a crime that shook Australia. Brunswick's an eclectic place. It's full of bars. It's got the longest shopping strip in Australia, which is Sydney Road. It's a very hipster area, and every city's got one, and it's, it's where the arts community really is. There's a lot of little bars there. It's very trendy. You go there, you have a drink on a Friday night or a Saturday night, and you enjoy yourself. No one's thinking about their safety in a big way in Melbourne generally. One weekend in September 2012, the sense of normality was rocked by a cruel and brutal act of violence. The perpetrator was a softly spoken predator, and his target was an innocent woman called Jill Ma. Originally from Ireland, Jill lived in Melbourne and worked at the ABC. September the 21st was just a normal Melbourne night. It's a really gregarious city. A lot of us go out after work on a Friday night. For Jill, it sounded like another Friday night. She was going out for drinks with, with work colleagues. She finished work about five o'clock in the afternoon. She went out with some workmates. And they were seen walking down South Bank on CCTV. She has a drink in the city, and then afterwards she heads out to close to where she lives uh, on Sydney Road to a place called the Brunswick Green. She's carried on through the night, had some more drinks, and then later in the evening ended up at Bar Etiquette, where she had a few more drinks. Bar Etiquette was only around 900 metres from the apartment Jill shared with her husband, Tom. Now, that worked for her in a, in a practical sense because it was very close to home. And at a certain point, she actually contacted Tom and suggested that he come down. At that stage, I think he was asleep on the couch and missed the message. When the bar closed at 1.30, she headed off home. So she leaves with a colleague from Bar Etiquette and he goes to get a cab and he tries to talk her into getting into the cab and giving her a lift home, which is very close. It's, uh, it's less than a kilometre from that bar. But she doesn't want it, she wants to walk home. So they um, a kiss on the cheek and he gets in the cab and then from there she's on her own and that's where she starts walking up Sydney Road. This seemingly minor decision would go on to have devastating consequences. Jill left the bar about 1.30am. At 2am, Tom tried to call her, didn't get in contact with her. Tom sent some text messages after that, trying to contact her. Well, I think it's really confusing for Tom that he can't get a text back. Her walk is really close. She would have made that walk many, many times before. And even though it's dark in spots, she wouldn't have felt that anything was going to happen to her. At 4am, he was so concerned that he actually left where they lived and started walking the streets trying to find Jill. By 6am, he was so concerned, he contacted the police to report her missing. When a person's reported missing to the local police, and that's where it basically starts, it goes to the uniform branch. So you walk into the police station, there's a uniform person there, and I want to report a missing person. They'll take details of description, any photograph, where this person may or may not have been, to get as much information about this particular person. And it's then assessed by the uniform people, and then escalated to the detectives in the uh, same police station. 
they again do an assessment and then they would have begun their search of tracing where she may have been and may not have been. So that would have stayed at, well, I would say, local level because we get so many missing persons reports given to the police. From the time that Tom reports his wife missing, there's a missing report go in, there's some inquiries, um, they look up things like has she used her bank card, all those sorts of things, and they don't find any sign of what's happened to Jill. Through the day on the Saturday, Tom contacted the people that Jill had been drinking with to find out her movements late on that Friday night. He rang around as much as he could to find out where Jill had been and what she had been doing, and the word of mouth spread very quickly. The police made inquiries. They followed the, the usual protocols on this, this sort of thing to try and find out what they were dealing with through the course of that Saturday. By the Sunday, there's a Facebook page that's gone up. There's also the, the starts of Twitter, um, social media activity, and that's when we really find out there's someone missing, and that's when the media get interested, and there's a press conference on the Sunday, a very small one at that stage, about a missing woman uh, named Jill Ma. I hope somebody sees saw something, or she just walked through the door. Do you still think that all, you know, could happen today? That you... I have to, I have to. Yeah. And we're hopeful for the best, obviously, but we have some concerns that she may have met with foul play. Within days, a Facebook group called um, Help Us Find Jill Ma had attracted 100,000 likes. It was a, a situation where the power of social media was shown up, sort of, in, in its greatness, I suppose. Tom sort of used it and applied it very, very readily to try and get to the bottom of, of what had happened straight away. And at the same time, obviously, the police were going through their inquiries as well and going through what they always do in these sorts of situations. And the media as well we jumped on the story very, very quickly on the Sunday. It's been a really difficult time for us um, because Jill is part of our ABC family and um, she's a very highly valued member. She's a great admin professional and we rely on her every day. It was something that just gripped Melbourne very, very quickly. By that Sunday night, everyone was wondering, where is Jill Ma? In the early hours of Saturday the 22nd of September 2012, a young woman called Jill Ma left a bar on Sydney Road in the Melbourne suburb of Brunswick and disappeared. Jill Ma was someone who was larger than life. She was very popular with her work colleagues at the ABC. She liked to have fun. Her mother described her as messy and uh, goofy. She was somebody who made other people happy just with her presence. Jill left bar etiquette at around 1.30 a.m. to walk the short distance to her flat. She never arrived. Her frantic husband, Tom, reported her missing at 6 a.m. the following morning, and police began searching the area. There then followed a social media frenzy, offering help and demanding information. The response from the public was quite overwhelming once it was put out there in the media. I suppose it would have helped the fact that she was part of the media herself, working for ABC. Not that that would have made any difference, because it's what the media would then pick up and then put out there. Ah, she was a very attractive lady, a young lady, um, and it's something that we've all done, you know, as we all should be able to do, is walk the streets of anywhere late at night and feel quite safe. It didn't make sense. He was this vivacious lovely girl who was on a short walk home from the bar to her home. He was a very, very concerned husband who had presented himself to the media, to the police. He was plainly very, very upset. There was this great confusion because nobody could understand where she was. Tom seemed very transparent in his concerns and nobody wanted to believe that the most sinister scenario, that perhaps something, you know, perhaps she had met foul play on this very, very short walk between the bar to her home. I don't remember seeing anything about Tom being accused of anything at that point, but certainly by the Monday morning, he makes an appeal to the press, in, in this time in a media scrum, for any information about his wife. Tom, what are you going through? Uh, hell, <laughs> it's just 
devastating. But um, yeah, just kind of push on. Um, At this stage, the homicide squad is investigating, and that's when you start to wonder what's going on with the husband. Where was the husband? And you start looking for answers. What the police did was obviously look at those people who are closest to Jill first, because quite often that's the situation in disappearances, is that somebody close to the, the victim is somehow involved. So they went to Jill and Tom's home, they searched that, they went and searched the car that they, they owned, and this is all filmed by the media and sort of obviously broadcast. They had to eliminate Tom as a person of interest. So, unfortunately, he's flat was uh, searched. The investigators don't know whether she was killed there and her body dumped and he's made a ruse. So the car becomes important as he transported the body somewhere. So they need to cover all of those. Whilst it's difficult in the early stages that people will look at the husband, the father, the wife, whoever else is close to the missing person, they become that focal point. But in the long run, investigators can then say, if it's unsolved, we've looked at the husband, we've looked at the wife or the, or the father, whoever it may well be, and we are more than satisfied that they are not involved in this particular missing person. So you start at the basics, eliminate them as persons of interest, be confident in yourself, and we can start looking elsewhere. My colleague had interviewed him, and he was certain that he had nothing to do with it. So we were relatively certain without absolutely knowing that he had no part in this and that he was looking for his wife, that he was devastated that his wife was not there. His fear in his eyes that something terribly, terribly wrong had happened. Although the court of public opinion was largely on Tom's side, police couldn't rule him out of their inquiries completely. But that began to change when a trawl of CCTV cameras in the area where Jill was last seen turned up a vital clue. It was critical that there be some sighting of Jill Ma before she goes missing. From the moment that she's left bar etiquette to the moment that she's trying to get home, where is she? Her colleague knows that she's walked along Sydney Road and we don't know anything else. Ultimately, investigators wanted to try and retrace where Jill would have been. They would have been aware that she was at a local bar so they'll be looking at getting CCTV from there. Has she left with someone? Has someone followed her out of the bar? And you start working your way back from there. Then they would have been walking along the route she would have taken, walking back home, and you are looking for CCTV cameras. And as luck had it, there was a number of CCTV cameras in the stores along her route, which they then were able to retrieve, which I had that identification of Jill walking up, and within seconds after that, you see a male person running after her. You see a man walking from the left side to the right side, and he's wearing a blue hoodie. And then a little bit later, you see Jill Ma come into the picture, and she's approached by the man in the blue hoodie, and they seem to talk. You don't think by looking at it that they know each other, but they might. She then takes her mobile phone out. She just seems a bit bothered by this person. And then you see them walk away from the left side. Again, a major breakthrough. But again, what do you read into that? The fact that it's there is that someone she knew that she happened to recognise in the street. But that's all we've got to go on. So we start working on that. We get a description. We can't identify this person. Who is this person? And what's happened after they've gone out of frame? Because it shows Jill Ma alive and well at a particular time. And that's his starting point. Who is this man that actually was seen running after her? Is this the offender we're looking at? So that's a major starting point for the investigators and very, very significant. And then they've got to look at, do we release it to the media to try and get the public on board to assist the investigators? <laughs> The CCTV footage changed the whole nature of the investigation. It showed that Jill did interact with other people on the way home. It also showed that she did leave the bar and probably intend to walk straight home because it was on the way home, the bridal 
shop from which the footage came from. It showed a man in a blue hoodie. He became the blue hoodie man. And at once, everybody needed to know, who is this man in the blue hoodie? It changed everything. He became, from that moment that footage was aired, he became the likely man of interest that everybody wanted to know about. What did he know, and did he have something to do with her disappearance? As police scoured hours of CCTV footage for more glimpses of Jill, other detectives have been searching the surrounding area for more clues. Police initially searched the area around the laneway off Hope Street in Brunswick and didn't find much of, of much note. They subsequently searched it again, I think, on the Monday morning and they found Jill's handbag, which contained a lot of items, including her ABC ID badge. Convinced that Jill's handbag, found in the alley, would lead to the killer, police were keen to understand how it had suddenly reappeared near the location of her last known sighting. Now that was a turn up because that handbag wasn't there on the initial search. That prompted all sorts of speculations because police wondered how did this handbag get placed back in this search area when it wasn't there previously. Tragically, what seemed like a clue turned out to be a red herring. A local resident had spotted Jill's handbag in the alley and taken it home. But then, spooked by all the news coverage, he'd returned the bag to where he'd found it the following day where it was discovered by police. What the bag did prove, however, was that Jill's disappearance was becoming more suspicious. I think some people feared the worst from the start, and I think when people accepted that Tom's story was very sincere, people started to wonder what the hell had happened. As the week proceeded and no information was forthcoming about Jill's whereabouts, I think a lot of people began to fear the worst. Once they've got the bag and once they've got the CCTV, there's very little doubt in investigators' mind, and I think anyone who was close to the case as a journalist or anyone watching it very closely thought there's something very wrong because it's not like someone like Jill Ma to just disappear. And the other thing is she's not using her phone and she's not using her bank cards or bank accounts. So we go to someone that's probably met with foul play very quickly in this scenario. In an effort to move the investigation forward, detectives turned to technology. The investigators would have been looking at Jill's phone, her mobile phone. Has she made calls? When she made calls? Is it still operative and what's happening with it? Can we identify the location of it? The amount of phones were bouncing off the same tower at that particular time. There would have been hundreds upon hundreds at that particular night of a Friday night, early hours of Saturday morning. It's painstaking work, but you've got to go through it. No one's going to come and hand you over the evidence. You've got to find it as investigators. And investigators are driven by getting the family's answers. What they discovered was that her mobile phone was in Brunswick until about 4.30am. Now, they looked at where her mobile phone went after that time and it travelled northwards, probably along the Tullamarine Freeway. At that stage, the investigators were able to cross-reference the time of her phone pinging off a tower at Moreland Road to all cars going under the gantry along the Tullamarine Freeway, the gantry being the toll point which photographs motor cars. And what they discovered by going through those number plates on those cars was that a well-known sex offender owned one of those cars that had gone through the gantry at about the same time that Jill's mobile phone started moving northwards. And so they tracked it back from there and came up with the name of Adrian Bailey. The mobile phone signal had been linked to a dangerous sex offender. The pressure was now on to track him down. With Jill Marr now missing for almost a week, Detectives were keen to make an arrest and finally find an answer to the question, what had happened to her? Police investigating the disappearance of Melbourne woman Jill Marr linked her mobile phone data to the movements of a local sex offender, 41-year-old Adrian Bailey. Following the identification of his vehicle, Police tracked Bailey down and began to question him. Adrian Bailey underwent what became a 10-hour interview with police. Now, for most of that 10 hours, he denied any involvement or any encounter. 
His starting point was that he knew nothing and had absolutely nothing to do with the disappearance of Jill Ma, but that he had heard about it in news reports. And that's all he knew about it. While police were interviewing Adrian Bailey, police were searching his house at the same time, and that's when they found Jill Ma's SIM card. The SIM card had turned up in Adrian Bailey's washing while his girlfriend, then girlfriend, was washing his clothes. And that was the crucial bit of evidence that linked him to Jill Ma. That would have been the most significant breakthrough for investigators. The fact is, you need to tie a potential suspect to a missing person, and this gave investigators that strong link. How else does Jill's SIM card from her phone get into the property in the private home of Adrian Bailey? There's got to be no other explanation, but the fact is, he is involved with this lady's disappearance. Bailey had a, a, a way with police interviews where he would always deny for hundreds and hundreds of questions, and at a certain point, he would break. Hours and hours into the interview process, he turned, basically, and said, yes, yes, I'm responsible. Yes, I feel very bad about it. I wish it hadn't happened. This happened about six or seven hours into the process with Jill Ma, and at that point, he became very forthcoming. Through some persuasion, he was then able to give some definition around what he'd done, which is how he ended up in a, a laneway off Hope Street and how he had raped and murdered Jill Ma. He admitted to talking to Jill Ma. He claimed that he was trying to be nice to her, that she'd been on the phone to her brother or to family, as far as he knew, and that he was trying to be nice. He was trying to have a conversation with her and that she had initially been nice and that she had then turned nasty. I think he talked about her flipping him off. Now, her flipping him off had sort of made him very angry and that had sort of subsequently led to his outburst of violence which had led to her death. After Bailey killed Ma, he went home, got his car and then drove back to retrieve the body. He had put her in the boot of his car, driven her along the Calder Highway to a place called Gisborne South in a, uh, a, a dirt road and he had buried her in a shallow grave. Uh, at that site. To me this shows a lot of planning, a very solid attempt to avoid detection with a view to protecting his own interests. So police were able to get him into a police car, he was going to help them to locate the body and they went up a lot of wrong alleys and roads trying to find where Jill Ma's body was. But they get to Black Hill Road and uh, it's at that point that he starts to realise where he is and he tells them to suddenly stop and he points over towards a site which he doesn't want to go to and he becomes fairly agitated. That's where they found Jill Ma's body. Jill's body was discovered partially naked from the waist down in a grave that was only 35 centimetres deep. Post-mortem results revealed that after being violently raped, she was strangled to death by Bailey. There's been no greater outpouring of emotion in Melbourne than this case and the death of Jill Ma. On the following day, after all of the police interviews, on the Sunday, 30,000 people marched along Sydney Road, the last place where Jill Ma was seen, as an outpouring of not only grief, but as a protest that things had to change and that people had to be protected from people like Adrian Bailey. That same night that Jill Ma was found, an out-of-sessions court was held where Adrian Bailey was charged with murder. So by the next morning, that news had spread all across Melbourne, the worst kind of news, that Jill Ma was dead. News with Peter Hitchner. Today's developments followed a dramatic arrest and the discovery of Jill Ma's body in a shallow grave northwest of Melbourne. A devastating discovery marking the end to a story all of Melbourne had been hoping would have a happy ending. Now, what happened with that is that social media and the internet went wild because the interest had been so intense. Adrian Bailey's name was all across the internet and there was a, there was a great outpouring, not just of grief, but of anger towards this man who had done something so horrible to such an innocent victim. Now, that would have consequences down the track in terms of his charging and the 
judicial process because once he is charged, evil or not, he's still entitled to a fair trial. And so the, this outpouring simply couldn't happen. Whilst you can't stop people doing it, you can try and plead with people, please do not put this stuff out on social media. Once a person's been charged, they're entitled to a fair trial. It is the courts that must identify innocence or guilt, not you, the community, not you, the investigators, but it's the courts. Investigators collect the facts, present them to the court, and at the point of a person being charged, that's when all media and all social media should stop and wait till this person gets a fair trial. This was such a serious concern at the time that the then Chief Commissioner of Victoria Police, Ken Lay, asked people to stop posting these sorts of messages online because it would have potentially such dire consequences. Frustratingly for journalists and reporters, their coverage of the case was restricted. But that didn't stop them delving into the background of Adrian Bailey to try and find information that could be used when the court proceedings allowed. What they would uncover was a man with a history of violence towards women that would defy comprehension. Adrian Bailey was born in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. He grew up there, played footy. He was a non-event. He was known to be a little bit of a loner. I don't think he had a lot of close friends. He was off the radar until the age of 18 when he married his first wife and she became pregnant. And it was at that stage that he first came to police attention. At the age of 18, he raped a friend of his sister's who was 17 at the time. He then subsequently attacked and attempted to rape another 17-year-old and then a 16-year-old. At that point, he was arrested and questioned at great length. He consequently confessed to those crimes and was charged. He was convicted and sentenced to five years in jail, but he only served 22 months of that uh, term before he's paroled. I saw Adrian Bailey in 1991. He was a teenager, he was charged with serious sex offences and uh, he went to court. I prepared a report for the court and that evidence was publicly led and uh, he was sentenced according to law. So in his case, he was not mad, he was bad. My recommendations inevitably would have been that he required treatment and monitoring. Given his age, I think he was about 18 at the time, um, I would have been perhaps more optimistic in terms of his prognosis than if I'd seen him as an older man. Bailey would go on to have two children with his first wife before they divorced in 1995. He remarried later that year and went on to have another two children before that marriage also broke down. For reasons we don't know, Adrian Bailey seemed to stay off the, the police radar for six or seven years until 2000, when he started attacking sex workers in, in the St Kilda area. Between 2000 and 2001, he's known to have attacked five sex workers. His attacks all followed a very, very similar pattern. Each of those victims described a very, very similar means of attack. And due to some very good policing by St Kilda detectives who pieced together these, these rapes on these sex workers, he was, he was eventually identified and, and questioned and interviewed at great length in about 2001. He confessed to those attacks. He told detectives that he considered the victims worthless. He said that he wasn't getting much sex at home at the time and that motivated the attacks. He was subsequently charged with, with 16 counts of rape and he was eventually convicted and sentenced to eight years of non-parole. I think it was an 11-year full sentence. Parole is the conditional release of a prisoner into the community at a point of time, either at the end of the prisoner's non-parole period or after that date has been reached and prior to the expiration of his actual sentence. In the case of Adrian Bailey, in 2002, he was sentenced to 11 years imprisonment with a non-parole period of eight years for multiple rapes on multiple complainants. The eight years was the non-parole period. He could not be released on parole until after he had served that time, which in fact is what happened. He then was released on parole in 2010. What happened next would shock the Australian public and the justice system 
to its core. One of the saddest things about this entire case is that Adrian Bailey shouldn't have been on the streets when he attacked Jill Ma. He was on parole and he'd breached that parole months and months earlier when he attacked a man in Geelong outside a cafe, breaking his jaw. He pleaded guilty to that, but he didn't like the sentence that he was given and appealed it. For some strange reason, the parole board didn't put him back in prison because they allowed him to remain out on bail while his appeal was going through the courts. The bottom line here is, had our justice system worked better, he wouldn't have been out in the streets and Jewel Ma would be alive today. The brutal death of Jill Ma in 2012 shocked not only Melbourne, but the entire country. The man responsible, Adrian Bailey, a convicted sex offender, was charged with murder. In March 2013, he entered a plea of guilty to one count of rape, but he denied the murder charge. Then, in a dramatic U-turn, he changed that plea to guilty, admitting that he was in fact a killer. I was there in the court on the day that Adrian Bailey pleaded guilty. He's a short man, very unprepossessing. He's got his sandy hair, a, a pockmarked face, a certain vanity about him. Whenever the juries walked into the room, he would straighten his tie and inflate his chest. Fairly softly spoken, and that was the striking thing about him. He could actually present as a, as a very average, normal sort of human being. He didn't actually look at first glance like an evil monster that he plainly was. He actually just looked like another bloke in the room. Justice Nettle sentenced Bailey to life imprisonment with a 35-year non-parole period for the murder of Jill Marr. He said in sentencing that if uh, Bailey hadn't pleaded guilty, he would have given him a, a life term without any possibility of parole, which probably reflected community sentiment at the time. There are worse crimes, believe it or not, but none of them have touched people in quite the horrible way that Jill's death did. Police officers said that they were looking at a potential serial killer, or what they termed someone who would definitely become a serial killer. Adrian Bailey is a monster. He set out to hunt and to hurt women for most of his adult life, and he belongs in a cage. Present for the sentencing were Jill's loved ones. From day one, you look back at how Jill's husband presented himself, how he was entirely transparent, he was very honest in how he felt. His grief was on public display. He was going through the, the most horrible thing he will ever go through, and he was very frank about it. He was very grateful for those who helped him. But that extended throughout the entire family, throughout the process. On the day that Bailey was sentenced, Jill's father came out in front of the court and, and gave a, a very simple and heartfelt thank you to both the police and the prosecutors for ensuring that justice had been done. Jill lived a life full of family, friends and her beloved Tom. Jill was brutally raped and murdered and is never coming back. Jill's family throughout the, the entire ordeal has been marked by this incredible dignity. They sort of stood almost as, a, as the polar opposite to the man who had done such a terrible thing. I've been really humbled by the support uh, of the Australian public, the um, tireless efforts of the police um, and all the friends and family who've uh, put their lives on hold to, to, to help us out. As the legal proceedings drew to a close, the awful truth about Bailey's past crimes was finally able to be publicised. Following relentless media coverage, the trial and the revelations about the killer, even more victims came to light. Bailey had already been convicted of 16 counts of rape between the years 2000 and 2001. And now, following his murder trial, three more women came forward and accused him of rape cases that would eventually see Adrian Bailey back in court. The first was an 18-year-old sex worker from St Kilda who claimed that in the year 2000, Bailey attacked her. 
she claimed that she was on her third job at the time and she was happened to be reading what was known as an ugly mug report, which was something that the sex workers circulated to protect themselves from the nasty clients at the time. And she was literally reading this report when Adrian Bailey pulled over, looking for her services, basically. She got into Adrian Bailey's car and she commented that um, there's a lot of bad guys that are in these streets and he replied, I'm one of those bad guys. And it was only years later, after the Jill Ma case, that she, she, she saw his face again and reported it to police. Unfortunately, the woman's evidence in the later trial was questioned and her identification of Bailey was found to be unreliable. In April 2012, however, it was claimed that Bailey attacked another sex worker, again in St Kilda. Like most of his attacks, he took her to a laneway, trapped her and basically spent a long period threatening her, punching her and raping her. During the course of the attack, he showed a, a very distinctive tribal tattoo on his arm and he told her that he attended the Phoenix Gym in Coburg. He basically gave her a lot of clues as to his identity for her to report to police. She eventually tries to kick her way out of the car and smashes the windscreen. At that point, Bailey said, what have you done? Um, I've only raped you. This, to me, indicates a complete lack of empathy, insight, and clearly desensitised to um, the process. In other words, uh, these people are depersonalised. He doesn't understand the seriousness of it. Traumatised, she didn't report it for two weeks. She had a history of mental instability. When she subsequently did go to the police, she was drunk and unwell. They didn't take a statement at the time. They ended up sort of committing her for treatment because she was so mentally unwell at the time. This is a pity because it happened five months before Jill Ma was killed. In July 2012, less than three months before the murder of Jill Ma, Bailey would attack a Dutch backpacker, again in St Kilda. He had approached the girl by calling her over to his car and telling her that she was being followed. She thought he looked normal enough and heeded his warning and jumped in. He subsequently took her to a laneway where he took most of his victims in that part of Melbourne, uh, trapped her against the wall so she couldn't get out and, and basically spent half an hour violently assaulting her. They followed a pattern, these attacks. Sometimes he would cry, sometimes he would apologise, and sometimes he would cry and apologise and then rape them again. Very, very similar in, in the nature, all of these attacks. She was very clever, told him that, you know, why not go back to my place, it'd be more comfortable there, and was very, very clever in getting away from him. She escaped when she got to the front door and had other housemates there and, and basically escaped his clutches. The great pity with this one is she provided a remarkable photo fit to police that looks almost identical to Adrian Bailey. Now that photo fit was out and about and on public display weeks before Jill Ma was attacked and killed. And you've only got to wonder, as some people do, if somebody had recognised Adrian Bailey from that photo fit, would Jill Ma still be with us today? In 2015, while in prison for the murder of Jill Ma, Bailey faced separate trials for each of these attacks. He pleaded not guilty to all of them and was found guilty on all counts. Bailey was sentenced to 18 years for the three rapes. However, in 2016, he successfully appealed his conviction for the attack on the St Kilda woman in 2000. The Court of Appeal cut his sentence by three years, meaning Bailey will be 83 before he can be considered for parole. In the aftermath of Bailey's sentencing, and after much public outcry over similar cases where the offender was released only to go on to commit further crimes, Australians began asking an important question. Just how effective was the current parole system? The purpose of parole is to provide a structured, supported and supervised release for a prisoner to transition back into the community on conditions which are aimed at reducing that prisoner's risk of reoffending and encouraging his rehabilitation. There is always a risk. There must be, with any human being, there is always a risk, and the board cannot eliminate risk. But what the board attempts to do is to minimise risk so as to make it 
acceptable. It became immediately apparent when Adrian Bailey was identified that he had slipped through the cracks of the justice system and it was clear right from the start that people needed answers. They really wanted to know how did this innocent woman come to be killed by somebody who shouldn't have been on the street. There were all sorts of flags going up all over the place and as we well know now, he was committing rapes on other victims and yet he was still able, unfettered by any sort of authorities or any sorts of controls, to do what he did to Jewel Ma. The Victorian government requested former High Court Justice Ian Callanan QC to undertake a review of the parole system and of the parole board. The principal recommendations are these, that one, the paramount consideration in any decision making, whether it be to grant parole, vary parole or cancel it, must be the safety and protection of the community. And that's the most important recommendation, I think. The second was that prisoners must take responsibility for applying for parole. This report draws a line in the sand. The culture of parole in Victoria must and will change. Adrian Bailey would be the most hated man in jail. Because of him, all parole doesn't happen at its earliest date. You have to apply for it now, and you won't necessarily be given it. You've got to basically earn it. Another important recommendation was the categorisation of a number of crimes into what are now called violent offences or sex offences. Any prisoner with a history of such crimes would require added scrutiny from the parole board. That prisoner would need to be assessed in terms of future risk, and if the risk was considered to be moderate or high, that prisoner had to undertake offender behaviour programs if he expected to get released on parole. Adrian Bailey would certainly have fitted into that category. In such a tragic case as the murder of Jill Marr, there are few positives. However, the sweeping changes made to the Victorian parole system in the wake of Jill's death serve at least as some meaningful legacy. I've often referred to the Jill Marr case as the catalyst for change. A Melbourne journalist, a very prominent one, recently wrote an article about the transformation of the board. And in the context of that transformation, he concluded his article by saying that the changes should be referred to as Jill's Law. This crime differs significantly from other crimes of this nature. It resonates and identifies the victim. Other cases have identified the offender. It goes by offender's name and people can relate to it. This is one of those rare cases that the media and the community resonate with the victim. And that's where we should be. I think the death of Jill Ma touched so many people because this sort of thing shouldn't happen in Melbourne. It certainly shouldn't happen anywhere, but Melbourne is, it considers itself a, a sort of big community. And it was something that gripped people at the time. I think everybody related to Jill Maher because he was a normal person living a normal life and does what we all do on a Friday night, not expecting anything like this could happen. She was only a couple of hundred metres away from home and she is basically not suspecting a predator to be in her midst, let alone someone with his history. It was a random attack on a, on a beautiful human being. It shouldn't have happened. The system should have done better by Jill Maher.